I didn't expect to be here. Here, giving this TEDx talk in England, a physicist, an academic. I'm not from an enriched background. This is me and my brothers and sisters standing in front of the new house on the farm in Saskatchewan, Canada. I'm the chubby little girl in front with the bow legs. And now here I am, living in England, working on an experiment sited in Japan with 500 collaborators from 12 countries and 59 happy institutions. So what is this fabulous research that's brought all of these people together? This room, this room that we're sitting in, is being flooded continually with a stream of a tiny, tiny particle called a neutrino. Neutrinos are produced in the sun and in other stars, and they just go zinging right through everything. Billions of neutrinos go through you every second, go through every square centimeter of you. If you look at your thumbnail, billions of neutrinos just went through you, honest. If I had a pound in you know, money for every neutrino that has ever gone through me, I'd have enough money to pay off the entire global public debt, all of it, for all the different countries. That would be great, so you can start giving me that money anytime. And I could do that not just once, but 10 million times over. And I'd still have enough left over to pay you back for your tickets if you don't like my talk. <laughs> so how is it that neutrinos do this? How is it that they're able to come zinging right through everything? Well, first we need to think about what everything is. What is the matter that makes up the universe? So you probably already know that the universe is made up of molecules, and those in turn are made up of smaller particles called atoms. An atom consists of a small, dense nucleus with electrons zinging around it. The electron is not made up of anything smaller. It's the end of the line. There's nothing inside it, it just, it just is. The nucleus is made up of particles called protons and neutrons, and those in turn are made up of smaller particles called quarks. And the quarks, like the electrons, are the end of the line. So, I've brought a few nuclei with me tonight in this jar, some little green nuclei. Okay, these are actually peas, because if I was really going to bring isolated nuclei, that would be much more difficult. <laughs> so, if a nucleus was this big, then the nearest electrons to it, the ones that belong to its atom, would be zinging around about half a kilometer away. So, from here in the Nuffield Theatre, They'd be zinging around, oh, out past the dentist's office that way, and out past Alexandra Square there, maybe having a cup of tea in the venue, that type of distance. And what's in between here and there in this atom? Nothing. Nothing at all. It's empty. In fact, it's better than empty. It's a vacuum. Except the vacuum isn't as vacuumy as we like to suppose. See, this P, my nucleus, has got protons in it, and they have an electric charge. And so they create an electric field that permeates outwards, and maybe we don't notice that, but the electron notices it. The electron is charged, and so these interact via the electromagnetic force. And indeed, that's what keeps electrons inside atoms, and therefore allows structure in the universe to exist. But what about our neutrino? Like the electron, it's not made up of anything smaller. Unlike the electron, it doesn't have an electric charge. And so that electromagnetic field between here and you know, the venue, that's nothing to it. It doesn't see that. It really is just vacuum to a neutrino. Now, the neutrino does have something that's called a weak charge. And so it does interact via the weak force. The thing you need to understand about the weak force is it's not weak. It's just extremely short range. So the protons and neutrons inside the P here, they have weak charge too. 
And so they create a weak field and it permeates, but it never gets beyond the confines of the pea. In fact, it's confined deep inside that nucleus. And so the neutrino would have to hit that pea dead on in order to interact. So what are the chances of that? Well, okay, let's imagine that we've got a neutrino coming zinging in from the sun, and it might hit this P, or, you know, it might miss it. It's not very big. And if it misses it, well, never mind. Can't it just hit the next P over? Yeah, well, it might, but the next P over is a kilometer away in any direction. And in between is a lot of vacuum. So most of the universe just looks like vacuum to a neutrino. The Earth is intangible to a neutrino. It goes right through it. It is the ultimate global traveler. And so neutrinos are not confined inside atoms. They don't hang out with the other particles. They are very antisocial. They're the, they're the biggest introverts. And just like most introverts, that makes it really hard to get to know them. See, the only way we know anything about any of the particles in the universe is if they interact in our detectors, then we can study their behavior and learn something about them. Neutrinos, however, almost never interact. But almost never isn't the same thing as never. So if we build large enough detectors, and if we produce enough neutrinos, then a very, very small percentage of them will interact, and then we'll be able to understand them a bit. This is an image of a neutrino interacting in a particle detector. That which you do not see coming in from the left is the neutrino. Somewhere near the middle, it interacts in the material, and it produces a spray of charged particles that come spewing out. And we can see and measure those charged particles. We can measure their properties. And that allows us to determine some of the properties of the neutrino that produce them. So what have we found out so far? Well, we know neutrinos almost never interact. <laughs> and they have a property we call flavor. They come in three different types or flavors. But the strange thing about them is that they change flavor. They change from one type of neutrino to another as they travel. I don't mean they interact, because this happens even in a vacuum. So they have this serious identity crisis, right? They start out as one personality, and they end up as a different personality. And that is an entirely quantum mechanical effect. Oh, so that's a bit heavy. Does anyone have some ice cream? I think I could <laughs> Perfect, perfect. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. Oh my goodness, look at that. It's got three flavors. <laughs> wow, how coincidental. Vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. Mm. But you know, we could think about this ice cream not just from the property of flavor, it's got other properties as well. This is all one brand of ice cream. Let's call it brand A. But there could be more than one brand of ice cream. There could be brand A, brand B, and brand C. And it's got these three flavors, vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. Now, there's no reason that we would suppose that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between those. I mean, there's no reason that brand A would only make vanilla, brand B would only make strawberry, and brand C would only make chocolate. I'm not an expert in such things, but I suspect that would be a really bad business model, <laughs> OK? So no, brand A makes all three flavors, same with brand B and brand C. So this is like having one brand of ice cream. But similarly, I could turn that around and consider it from the flavor state. Okay, what if I had a bowl full of just strawberry ice cream? It was all strawberry, but it had all three brands. I could do that. I could have some of brand A and some of brand B and some of brand C, and it would be all strawberry. So then I'd have one flavor that's a mix of the three brands. Now think about neutrinos. You knew it was going to come back to that, didn't you? Yeah. So now think about the neutrinos. Let's say that their flavors were vanilla, strawberry, and chocolate. They have other properties, too. For example, they have three masses. 
which we have very creatively named Mass 1, Mass 2, and Mass 3. We're not artists, we're scientists. <laughs> okay. And just like with the ice cream, there is not a one-to-one -one mapping. So it turns out the vanilla neutrino is not all mass one, and the strawberry neutrino is not all mass two, and the chocolate neutrino is not all mass three. It doesn't work like that. The vanilla neutrino is a mix of all three masses. And the converse is also true. A mass one neutrino is a mix of all three flavors. So this, for example, is a neutrino mass state. It has all three flavors, vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. Now, let's just say that it starts over here in the vanilla state. I'm just saying vanilla because that's the one that's facing me. And let's pretend that it's going to travel towards me. Just go with me for a moment. And it's spinning as it travels. And when it comes to me, I'm going to use my flavor detector to see what flavor of neutrino I've got. Oh, I think I've got some on my chin. <laughs> I think it's chocolate, but I should have a little more because sometimes it's really hard to tell the flavor of a neutrino sometimes. No, I still think, oh, it was some chocolate on a vanilla. That's cheating. Let's say it was chocolate. <laughs> so what would I need if I was going to predict which flavor of neutrino I'd get? Well, the first thing I'd need is a nice equation. <laughs> ah, that will do. Then I'd want to know what was the flavor it started in to begin with. And that's given by the new alpha, the sort of scrolly V sub A on the far left of that equation. Then I'd want to know what was the mix of flavors to begin with, because what if it was mostly chocolate in there to begin with, with just a little bit of strawberry and vanilla, right? That's given by the symbol theta in the middle, the sort of scrolly O. Then I'd want to know how fast those flavors were changing, how fast was it spinning, how fast were the flavors mixing. That's given for neutrinos by the differences in those three masses. And it's shown here by the delta m squared, the sort of triangle m squared. Then I'd want to know how far it had traveled. That's given by L. And it also depends on the neutrino energy. And if I knew those things, I'd be able to predict the flavor changing. Measuring those parameters also gives us some insights into into the universe and how it is evolving. So we all know from watching the movie Angels and Demons that when matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate and produce lots of light. And OK, we do also know that from particle physics experiments as well. <laughs> and those experiments also tell us that whenever matter is created, pretty much an equal amount of antimatter is also created. OK, then. So if the universe began with a Big Bang, creating pretty much an equal amount of matter and antimatter, then you know, why didn't they just all annihilate? I mean, why, why does all this stuff exist? Or why isn't it all light? Why aren't we light? I personally would like to be light. I think that would be very cool. But I'm not light. I'm stuff, right? You know, look at me. Just checking. Just checking. That too. Also stuff. Well, you see, it turns out that if the way in which neutrinos change flavor is a little bit different from the way in which antineutrinos change flavor, if these parameters that we measure are a little different for antineutrinos than they are for neutrinos, it could explain why we live in a universe that's made up of matter. So neutrinos are the reason I'm here tonight. And even though you maybe didn't know it, they may well be the reason you're here tonight, too. Thank you.